We're going to start a study tonight on Zechariah. And uh, many people who teach the Bible get nervous about this book because it's, uh, it's not an easy book. It's uh, considered by many to be uh, one of the most difficult in the Old Testament. But let me tell you, it's the most messianic in the Old Testament, uh, certainly among the minor prophets. It's sometimes called the apocalypse of the Old Testament. We're going to discover as we get into this very strange, very difficult book in, many, in the minds of many, and yet we'll see emerge all kinds of special insights. Of course, it'll present the Messiah as the branch who will remove iniquity, the stone, it'll speak about his throne, it'll speak about his temple, his coming king. We're going to encounter all these famous, incredible prophecies. It'll, of course, figure prominently in the triumphal entry. It predicts the uh, entry on the donkey. It's fulfilled on the exact day that's described in, in the scripture. One of the prophecies will describe his betrayal, the amount of money that was transacted, where the transaction took place, and who finally ends up with the money. Very interesting little prophecy. And, of course, the crucifixion. Several chapters on the second coming. So it's, you're going to discover it is a very timely book. And it focuses on the day of the Lord, or day of Yahweh, if you will. It'll talk about the return of Israel to the land in unbelief. They're passing through the Great Tribulation. The siege of Jerusalem by all the Gentile powers. And their ultimate deliverance by King Messiah. As we go through this book, we're going to constantly find all kinds of little tidbits hidden here and there. We'll find the only physical description of the Antichrist that's in the Bible that I know of. It'll even describe the uh, uh, weapons effects of a neutron bomb, believe it or not. Very interesting things that we'll encounter uh, in the book of Zechariah. It also, I believe, holds the key to solving a major mystery among prophecy buffs. How do you reconcile mystery Babylon of Revelation, which seems to be so Vatican in its complexion, with the literalness of Babylon as described by Isaiah and Jeremiah? How do those strange prophecies, uh, how do they get resolved? I think Zechariah will show us the key to that. And it's the most challenging little book, uh, second only to Isaiah in its uh, distinctiveness and, and its importance as a messianic book. And of course, it's a, it's a fabulous little book. Now, before I get into the book itself, and I know we have many new people here, so if the regulars will just put up with a few preambles that I'm sure you're tired of hearing about, but I think it makes sense to put in the front end of a, an introduction on a new book, is our views of inspiration. Not that you need to share these, but so that you at least know what kind of bizarre uh, views uh, you're faced with. One of the great discoveries in my life, which is background in engineering, is uh, that the Bible we now discover is an integrated message. Even though it's penned by 40 different guys into the 66 volumes that lay in your laps right now. 66 books penned by 40 different guys over thousands of years. Think about that. Yet we now discover, by examining it closely, that it is provably of a singular design. We discover not only the place names and all the details of the text are there by deliberate design, even the numerical properties of the text are now being revealed by computers to defy simulation. Very unusual discoveries being made every day. So we have an integrated message system, but the second point is you can prove that not only is it an integrated message, but that its origin is from outside time. And again, this is one of the things that I think is, it's been so useful to me. I perhaps am overemphasizing it in some of our studies. But I think that you and I have the ability to be liberated from a misconception about time that has absorbed thinkers for thousands of years. Philosophers for thousands of years have argued about every conceivable thing in, under the sun. But the one thing most of them took for granted was that time was linear and absolute. Uh, they just implicitly did But today we discover, thanks to the insights of Dr. Einstein and subsequent uh, discoveries, that time is a physical dimension, a physical property. Time changes with mass acceleration or gravity. Now, why is that important? Because you and I tend to think of time as linear. We tend to think of a timeline. We draw a line on a blackboard from left to right, the left end being the birth of something or the beginning of an empire, and the right end of the line being the termination of the empire or the death of a person. We think of timelines. And because of that background... We tend to imagine, when we encounter the concept of eternity, we think of someone who has lots of time. We think we visualize a line, maybe not thinking about it this way, but we just presume that it's like a line that starts at infinity on the left and goes to infinity on the right. We think of God as someone who has lots of time. 
failing to appreciate that God is not subject to the restrictions of mass, acceleration, or gravity. So God is not somebody who is subject to any time constraints at all. He's outside time. And if he has the technology to create us, he has the technology to get a message to us. The question is, how does he authenticate it? How does he let us know that the message is really from him and not a contrivance or a fraud of some kind? Well, one way is to demonstrate that the message originates from outside time by describing history in advance. We call that prophecy. One of the most breathtaking realities is to discover that the Bible anticipates history in advance. The origin of Israel, its entire history, its ups and downs, including its future, and perhaps most dramatic for you and I, its present situation today, are all manifestly written in advance. And in fact, the book we're going to focus on, the book of Zechariah, is pivotal in understanding what's going on in the Middle East this week, next month, the coming years. Some very, very profound insights that God lays out in Zechariah's work. And so, now as we approach this book, we're going to approach it rather intensely. But we have a guideline that's become sort of a trademark of our ministry. We've studied the Bible for over 40 years, taught it for about 25. But uh, as a hobby, only in the last five years have we ventured to do this full time. But one of the trademarks that sort of has emerged over the years is Acts 17.11. In Acts 17.11, Luke tells you about the Bereans, that they were more noble than those in Thessalonica in that They received the word with all openness of mind, but they searched the scriptures daily to prove whether those things be so. So you need to understand that I'm relying on you to do that. And by my being able to rely on your doing that, it will allow me some freedom to skirt out in the speculative fringes a little bit. Because I'm going to trust you to not trust me. Luke tells you in Acts 17.11, don't believe anything Chuck Mister tells you. But search the scriptures daily to prove whether those things be so. But if you you understand the view of inspiration we have, we speak of a high view of inspiration. I think we have the highest. We think that every detail, every detail in the original is shepherded by the Holy Spirit in very profound ways. And I won't dwell on that. So many of our briefings and so forth deal with that head on. But since we have new people, we're studying a new book. I want to sort of get these premises behind us because there's something that we probably will not spend much time on. And that's what's called textual criticism. If you read commentaries on any of the books of the Bible, you'll find typically a substantial space devoted to their authenticity and their reliability. Those are different issues. Uh, textual issues. Did so-and-so really write such-and-such? And, such? and uh, when Jesus Christ authenticates a book, that's good enough for me. I don't, I'm not going to waste time on that. I'll comment on a few things as we go, but they'll be very peripheral to our main interest. Because our main interest is not to defend the book of Zechariah. It doesn't need defending. Our, our main interest is to try to understand what God has for you and I in this book for today. And to do so expositionally. Now, there are people, just as you, some of you probably have heard about Isaiah. There's scholars, they're typically of German origin, that wrote their doctoral thesis trying to prove there are two Isaiahs or three and all that, which just proves they've never studied John chapter 12, which destroys those theories. There's also a group, not as competent or as well known, that have tried to say that Zechariah was written by two different guys. Chapters 9 through 14 being a separate book. Not so. Those arguments are thin in the first place, easily refuted, and recent textual discoveries make them pretty de minimis, in my opinion. So we're not going to spend a lot of time on that sort of thing. So Zechariah uh, was a contemporary of Haggai, and he wrote in what's called the post-exile period. In other words, one of the main events in Israel's history was when they were made slaves to Babylon for 70 years. The prophets prior to that warned of it. The prophets during it uh, commented on it, and then the prophets that focused after the Babylon captivity are called post-exile prophets, and Zechariah being one of the most interesting ones. He was a Levite, born in Babylon. He was born during that captivity. As I say, he was a contemporary of Haggai, a younger, of course, and um, he was a contemporary of Zerubbabel, who was the governor when, when they returned to uh, rebuild the uh, temple in Jerusalem. And Joshua was the high priest. Zerubbabel and Joshua figure prominently in some of our historical comments here. Now, Zechariah was among those that returned to Jerusalem with about 50,000 captives. When Cyrus the Persian conquered Babylon, Daniel presented to Cyrus a letter written to him in which uh, God describes his career, calls him by name, it was written 150 years earlier, and describes how he was going to conquer Babylon, which, of course, he did. And, of course, when he saw that, he was impressed. And so he gave the order to allow the subjugated Israelis to go home. 
And in fact, he gave them financial incentives, made a donation to the, the temple, gave them each a, a, a stipend to go. And so he encouraged them. 50, only 50,000 went. You hear all of this about the return. Only about 50,000 took advantage of this. The rest of them were very comfortably ensconced in the, in the society at large, so they uh, didn't go. But 50,000 did return, and um, uh, they were under the leadership of Zerubbabel, uh, the governor, and uh, uh, undertook to rebuild the temple. And uh, Haggai prophesied to them, because they started with great zeal, but then they got very discouraged, and Haggai was there to encourage them. And uh, Zechariah was a very young man, I believe, at that time. Now, the names are interesting. Uh, we're going to discover Zechariah means whom Yahweh remembers, or Jehovah remembers, if you prefer Jehovah. He's the son of Berechiah, which means Yahweh blesses, who in turn was the son of Edo, which means the appointed time. So Yahweh remembers and blesses at the appointed time, if you look at their genealogy. And it's interesting how, you see, you have to understand, by the way, you'll see Zechariah mentioned, spoken of as the son of Edo. He's actually the grandson. They don't have a word for grandson like we do. So a son is simply not necessarily an immediate son. It could be you know, second, third, fourth. And just like Jesus was the son of David, in a sense. But genealogically, that's 14 generations. You follow what I'm saying? Okay. In any case, it's interesting how sometimes these genealogies, the very names, seem to proclaim a truth. It's interesting that the Holy Spirit seems to encourage this because we have this whole business of Melchizedek dealt with in Hebrews chapter 7. And uh, the genealogy of Genesis 5 is another provocative possibility. And incidentally, Edo is uh, mentioned in the book of Nehemiah as one of the priestly families that were returning. So we know that Zechariah was not only a Levite, he was a priest, uh, just as Ezekiel and Jeremiah were, interestingly enough. And now there's about 30 Zechariahs in the Bible, 29 in the Old Testament alone. It's a fairly popular name. But it's interesting that in Matthew uh, chapter 23, verse 35, we find a verse that says, "...that upon you may come all the righteous blood shed upon the earth from the blood of righteous Abel unto the blood of Zacharias, son of Berechias, whom ye slew between the temple and the altar." This is Jesus making a remark in uh, Matthew 23. But from Abel unto Zacharias, the son of Berechias. So if this is the same one, it seems like it it would, uh, on face value, it might be. That tells us how Zacharias finally died, although be it an old age. The Jewish Targum states that Zechariah was the son of Edom, was slain in the sanctuary, and was both a prophet and a priest. So there's just a little background on those guys. Josephus mentions the murder of Zacharias, the son of Berechiah, as perpetrated in the temple by the zealots just before the destruction of Jerusalem. So this is uh, possibly the same. It could be another. Now, it's interesting that Zechariah, in a sense, his book is called The Apocalypse of the Old Testament, and in a sense, he closes the Old Testament. It's not the last book in the collection, obviously, but his prophecies, in a sense, close the Old, uh, the Old Testament. And another Zechariah opens the New Testament with the announcement of his son, who's going to be John the Baptist. You may recall that. It's interesting that Zechariah means Jehovah remembers. His wife Elizabeth would mean his oath by the, some reckonings. So uh, he also, the Zechariah in the New Testament, is also a priest. And the angel ends 400 years of silence when he announces John the Baptist to the other Zechariah. So it's kind of interesting. The book was written about 520 B.C. That's roughly contemporaneous with Haggai. And however, Zechariah contains more Messianic prophecies than all the other minor prophets put together. Now let me comment about this minor. You run into this term, the minor prophets. And that's a tragic label. It's a scholastic label because we have major and minor prophets. There are four major prophets who wrote five books. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and Daniel. And Jeremiah having written also Lamentations. So there's five books that we call the major prophets. Why are they major? Only because their writings are longer. It's a typical, it's like a librarian's category. Not very illuminating really. Minor prophets are simply small ones. Perhaps a more uh, descriptive label comes from the Hebrew scriptures where they're known as the twelve. How many minor prophets are there? Twelve. That's easier. At least you learn something with it. And by the way, Zechariah is the most prominent of them all. It is the most frequently quoted of them, there are 71 quotes or allusions in the New Testament. There's a third of these in the Gospels, but there's 31 in Revelation. And by the way, 20 of those are from chapters 1 through 8, 8 from chapters 9 through 14. So when you study the book of Revelation, you see it linked so heavily to both parts of Zechariah, the first and last half, in a sense. Uh, it destroys, in my mind, any validity to the so-called Deutero-Zechariah theories. So enough of all that stuff. 
little uh, background on the time. It's important to get a perspective of the time. Jerusalem fell to the armies of Nebuchadnezzar in 586, and that marked the finale to the kingdom of Judah, just as the Assyrians over a century earlier uh, marked the end of the northern kingdom. After Solomon died, there was the civil war, and the, the nation of Israel split into two. The northern kingdom went to, from bad to worse, and God used the Assyrians to wipe them out, in effect, in uh, 722 B.C. Judah declined, had a couple of ups beats, but in general also declined, and it was 586 that God used Nebuchadnezzar to judge the southern kingdom. And most of Jerusalem's inhabitants were ultimately deported to Babylon for the 70 years. It's prophesied by Jeremiah. Jeremiah 25 and 29, there's much on that. I've talked a lot about this. It was during this exile that Daniel received the revelation of the Gentile kingdoms that makes his book so prominent, and how they would be dominant over Judah and Israel, until God would set up his kingdom. In other words, Daniel's foresaw that the series of Gentile kingdoms, in fact, literally four of them, uh, the fourth one in two parts, would be dominant. And uh, this period of time that started with Nebuchadnezzar and will go to the Antichrist is called in the scripture the times of the Gentiles. Luke uses that, for, uh, in the book of Luke, chapter 21, verse 24, is that this, uh, it was referred to by Jesus Christ as the times of the Gentiles. When did they begin? With Nebuchadnezzar, definitively in the book of Daniel. And uh, when will it end? When the Antichrist is taken care of. So uh, we're in that period of time about which the Bible says a a surprisingly great deal. Uh, Now, Babylon had slaves for 70 years, gets conquered by the Persians, and uh, Cyrus, his decree that they could return to uh, to Jerusalem and build their temple is in 2 Chronicles 36, verses 22 and 23, which, by the way, tells you in that verse why the Babylonian captivity it's because they didn't keep the Sabbath years. We all know about the, the Sabbath for man. Six days you work, the seventh you rest. We're all familiar with that. It was also a Sabbath for the land. Six years you plowed it, the seventh you let it lay fallow. They were supposed to keep the Sabbath year for the land. They didn't. And after 490 years, God says to them, you owe me 70. And that's why the Babylonian captivity is definitively 70 years long. And that's not a contrived view by some chart maker publishing a newsletter or something. That's in Second Chronicles 36, verse 22 and 23. Now, the whole story of Cyrus encouraging them to go back and build their temple is really recorded in the book of Ezra. And they don't get very far, a very discouraging time. They ultimately do get the authority to rebuild the city, the wall around the city to protect themselves from their enemies. And that occurs in Nehemiah. So Ezra and Nehemiah together constitute the rebuilding of the so-called Second Temple and uh, is a key part of the history that's the background for the book of Zechariah. Don't confuse the Joshua, it's the high priest we'll encounter during this period with the Joshua way, way back that was a successor to Moses. Don't confuse the two personages. Levitical sacrifices were reinstituted on a rebuilt altar right away, and that's Ezra chapter 3. And uh, in the second year of their uh, return, the foundation of the temple was laid, But they had a lot of oppression from the Samaritans and other enemies and internal uh, dissension of various kinds. And so 16 years of spiritual apathy followed until the rule of Persian king Darius Thespis. And it's in the second year of uh, Darius, 520 B.C., that God raised up Haggai on the one hand to encourage them in the rebuilding. He preached four sermons in four months and then disappeared from the scene. And uh, two months after Haggai delivered his first sermon, Zechariah began his prophetic ministry, encouraging the people towards spiritual renewal and motivating them to rebuild the temple by revealing to them God's plans for the future. So Zechariah uh, compliments Haggai, but in a di- Haggai deals with the moral issues and that encouragement. Zechariah is going to encourage them in a little different way. The same issue, to get them encouraged rebuilding their temple, but he's going to lay out the whole future. So... With this encouragement, the people did complete the temple uh, in about five years, 515 B.C. That's in Ezra 6, roughly. Now, it's very interesting. We're going to discover the first six chapters of the book of Zechariah are a series of eight visions that occur one night. Apparently, from the text, most scholars believe they all occurred in one evening. Eight short, cryptic little visions. They're precisely dated and uh, everyone talks about the precision of the dating. I have a theory I can't prove. I have no big surprise to reveal to you as to why those dates are so precisely nailed down. 
I do have the conviction from other experiences with the Scripture that when the Holy Spirit goes to the trouble of nailing down the date precisely, it has profound implications. For example, Daniel 9, the 70 weeks, predicts the exact day that Jesus was to ride this donkey into Jerusalem. And we'll talk about that when we get to Zechariah 9 in detail there. Many of you are familiar with that. We also notice in Genesis chapter 8, verse 4, that the Ark of Noah, the Holy Spirit tells us, that the flood of Noah ended on the 17th day of the 7th month. Now, whenever the Holy Spirit puts that in the text, there's some reason for it. And when you unravel that, you'll discover that seventh month in Exodus becomes the first month, the month of Nisan. You also discover that Jesus' crucifixion is on the 14th of Nisan, on Passover. How long was he in the grave? Three days. So when was he resurrected? On the 17th day of the month that was the seventh month in Genesis. In other words, the new beginning after the flood of Noah was on the anniversary in anticipation of our new beginning in Jesus Christ. So when you start discovering those kinds of things, you quickly can draw the inference that whenever the Holy Spirit gives you a detail, is for a reason. But it's a wonderful treasure hunt because in my own searches of the prophetic, and I've gone through, I think, two dozen commentaries on Zechariah, and everyone comments on the precision of the dating, but no one has any theories, even cockamamie ones, as to what that, why do we need to know it was where it was? So we'll see. On, you know, that uh, Haggai's first sermon was on August 29th, of 520 B.C. I thought I'd share that with you. Now, you have to read, probably have to translate this into other calendars, too, into what the Jewish calendar looked like and how it went through perturbation. So it's probably a very ambitious study to get into this. But it was in September 21st that the temple building was resumed. Haggai's second sermon was October 17th, 520 B.C. But October, November, that period that Zechariah's ministry began, he was probably 30, but that's a conjecture on my part. Because that was, he's a priest, and that's, that would be the time that he normally start. But we know he was at least 27 or 28 by the use of the language that's used. But I suspect he was 30 because that's when a priest was started to officiate. That's a guess on my part. And uh, Haggai's third and fourth sermons were December 18th. Zechariah's eight visions was on February 15th, 519. I should tell our gang to make a note of that for our calendar when we publish that. That should go on. But anyway, we'll move on here. There are many that make arguments that Zechariah, especially verse, chapters 9 through 14, were written by somebody else purporting to be Zechariah. The arguments are based on stylistic differences, but that's frankly nonsense because there's more stylistic commonality between the two parts than there are differences, and the differences are easily explained by the fact that he wrote the one when he was 30 and the other when he's probably 70. So he's gotten older and more mature. Who knows? Uh, but also the political situation is very different in the second part of the book. So, but there's another thing. Uh, uh, we discover that... Um, in the Dead Sea Scrolls, there's a Greek manuscript, the book of Zechariah, and chapter 8 and chapter 9 segments, there's no break between them. So we know that uh, it was treated as a single book in the days of Christ. He authenticates it that way, in my view. And then also, so does the Dead Sea Scrolls support that view. So these conjectures by critics, I don't think, uh, have any serious merit. And uh, Jesus re- received all 12 of the prophets, as they're called, what we call the minor prophets, as the scripture of God. And... Uh, Josephus and others also present the book of Zechariah as we now have it. So these scholastic arguments, to me, do not carry a lot of weight. We're going to discover the first six chapters detail these eight visions. And they're probably, in a sense, the most troublesome part of the book, because some of them are very cryptic, and we'll try to deal with those. Then there's about two chapters of a historic interlude, which primarily deals with questions about the fast days. And remember, he was a priest, so there are some issues that will emerge there. But in all of these, prophecies leap out almost between the verses. It's very exciting. And um, the Messianic prophecies of Jesus Christ, chapters 9 to 11, deals with those. And uh, the first advent of Christ from 9 to 11, and the second coming of Jesus Christ, the last three chapters. So we have um, 9 through 14 that's prophetic from our point of view in in time since. And we'll go more into the chronology where it needs to come up. At this point, it's probably time for us to jump in and get into the book itself. It's always hard to figure out what to put up front as sort of introduction. But I think if there's something that I forgot to mention, it'll surface as we go through the uh, the thing. I might mention that where Haggai's ministry seems very short, uh, Zechariah's ministry seems to have stretched over a 50-year period. From about 520 B.C. through about 470 B.C. And we'll deal more with the chronology. Let's jump in and take a look at uh, Zechariah chapter 1. And if you just go to the Malachi, turn left one book, you'll be at Zechariah. 
we're going to discover that there's a call to repentance that front ends this whole book. And it's interesting, it establishes that prerequisite to God's blessings are going to be promised to Israel in the eight uh, visions that follow. But uh, some of the authorities call this one of the strongest and most intensely spiritual calls to repentance to be found in the Old Testament. So we tend to skip over the first six verses, which are sort of the preamble, and get into the visions. Let's not do that. Let's look at these more carefully. And uh, God will not just bestow comfort on unrepentant hearts. And uh, God's covenants with Abraham and with David rendered certain the fulfillment of certain promises, of purposes for Israel. And uh, those covenants did not nullify the need for each generation of Israelites to be obedient to God in order to experience His promised blessings. Now think about that. God gave them unconditional promises. And yet it was a prerequisite condition for them to be repentant, each generation, in order to avail themselves of those. What's the implication for us? I'm going to suggest that uh, uh, the requirement for repentance is upon each of us. Let's jump chapter 1, verse 1. In the eighth month, in the second year of Darius, came the word of the Lord unto Zechariah, the son of Berechiah, the son of Edo, the prophet, saying... Now, the eighth month, that began on October 27th, 520 B.C. And uh, uh, it was what we would call November. Haggai had begun in the sixth month of that same year and prophesied September, October, but not, and December, but not November. Zechariah seems to have stepped into a gap of some kind. Perhaps the most significant thing that the Holy Spirit would have us draw from verse 1, there's something very subtle here, but very important, and that is you notice that the, here's a Jewish prophet dating his prophecy according to the reign of a Gentile king. That's very different than you'll find in the pre-exile prophecies. They usually it's the, it's the reign of king this guy, the, one of the kings of Judah or Israel, the northern or southern houses. No. In this case, it's dated from a Gentile king. This is a demonstration, something that we can establish uh, many other ways, but that the times of the Gentiles had begun. If you understand the Jewishness of these writings and you understand how unusual this is, it, it underscores, it's sort of a vivid reminder that we're in the times of the Gentiles. Now, Darius I was the great uh, Achaemenid uh, prince, uh, and he saved the Persian Empire, which was in revolt when it, after the death of Cambyses II, who in turn succeeded Cyrus the Great. So Cyrus the Great's successor died, and it was in shambles, but Darius I saved the empire. And uh, uh, this empire that Cyrus the Great started ruled for 200 years most of the known world. And it was the same Darius who was prominent in the datings of Haggai and Zechariah. And uh, he is no less famous archaeologically. If you're a student of archaeology, he recorded his triumph over his enemies in three languages, trilingually, if you will, on a famed rock of uh, Behistun, which is in the museums. Uh, The decipherment of this rock is what has uh, unraveled the mysteries of uh, the cuneiform writings. And uh, the Babylonian and Assyrian cuneiforms were unraveled by the, the rock of Behistun, and that's the one that uh, records Cyrus's, I mean Darius's uh, victories. Now, we're going to discover four key sermons here in the next three, or in verses three through six, were delivered three months before the eight night, the eight night visions. And these, it's been about 18 years since Cyrus issued his famous decree to allow them to go back home. And uh, came the word of the Lord unto Zechariah. This phrase comes up 14 times in this book. It's the same expression that Haggai used, but here identifies who the real author is. And as I say, he's the son of Berechiah, the grandson of Edo the priest. They didn't have a word for That's why it says son of Edo. They didn't have a word for grandson. So the implication is that probably his father died young. And that's why his grandfather is also alluded to here, which is a little unusual. Verse 2, the Lord hath been sore displeased with your fathers. There's a strange construction in the Hebrew here. It says, he's, the Lord is angry with anger. And uh, this is emphasized by three grammatical devices. The initial position of the verb in the sentence, the use of the cognitive accusative, that is to be angry with anger. It's a Hebraism meaning to be severely angry. And it's very similar to a uh, Arabic word, which means to be read with anger. So God is upset. Now we read that so casually, and yet it's uh, important for us to recognize that God can get angry. And uh, he's warning them not to repeat the errors of their father. 
And uh, the warning uh, for the present extended divine grace in verse 3, and it drew its severity from three lessons. One of disobedience, delay, and doubt. Verse 4 will deal with disobedience, verse delay with verse 5, and, and doubt with verse 6. And both testaments, you know, there's a mistake we all make because we're all victims of our Sunday school simplicity, saying the God of the Old Testament, the God of the New. No, it's the same God yesterday and today and forever. And God's wrath, which seems to us sometimes to be emphasized in the Old Testament, is also very vivid in the New, and His mercy is evident in both places. His love you'll find in Exodus 34, Deuteronomy 7, and other places. So, Now, verse 3, Therefore say thou unto them, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Turn ye unto me, saith the Lord of hosts, and I will turn unto you, saith the Lord of hosts. Thus saith the Lord of Zabaoth, the Lord of hosts. It occurs 52 times in this book, Three times just in this verse, and it'll show up 18 times in chapter 8. It's a very strange expression. And the, the word Sabaoth is like a, it's translated host. It's actually armies, the Lord of the armies. And uh, that's what the word really means. Uh, Sabaoth is that which goes forth, army, war, warfare, host. It's a host of either army or of angels. It flies to both places. And uh, it also is a warlike term and implies war. 485 occurrences in the Bible with it's used of the armies of Israel in Judges 5 and 1 Samuel 17. But it's also used of the armies of heaven in 1 Kings 22 and Luke 2 and Revelation 19. And it says to return, or turn to the Lord. We would use the term return. Now it's to repent. The one thing that's emphasized here, this is a prerequisite for all of us before re- receiving any of God's blessings. And that's also in the New Testament, not just the Old. Now, one of the questions we should ask ourselves as we go through Zechariah, are the people today, are God's people today, any more heavenly inclined than they were in Zechariah's day? Heaven help us if we're not, because the, the, these, these words that he's going to uh, aim at his people then apply to us. I might remind you of the Christian's bar of soap as just one example. Christian's bar of soap, 1 John 1, nine, right? If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and do what? Cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So the same repentance is a prerequisite to you and I. Well, I'm saved. Praise God. What are you doing with it? Repentance. Now what Zechariah is going to try to get across is we have to be responsive to the lessons of history if we do not wish to be destroyed. That's really what he's saying. Verse 4. Zechariah can do Be ye not as your fathers... Unto whom the former prophets have cried, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Turn ye now from your evil ways and from your evil doings. But they did not hear nor hearken unto me, saith the Lord. It's a risky business to waste the lessons of previous generations. And it's interesting how many ways this applies to us today. It's tragic, even if you just think, if you just think in secular terms in this country, having lost the lessons of the founding fathers of this country the lengths they went to to put in checks and balances and so forth and to watch how casually that's treated today. Well, we won't start on that one. But Hegel has a great quote. I love to use Hegel's quote. History teaches that man learns nothing from history. Now, a call to repentance is one of the primary goals of prophecy. We get interested in prophecy because it's so intriguing in so many ways, but we never should lose sight that its primary goal is to call us to repentance. And I won't ask for a show of hands, but is is this being effective in your life? That's a question you can ask yourself as we progress through this book. And uh, the other thing that uh, the next verse emphasizes is the brevity of time that we have for opportunities, if we're going to do anything significant. Look at verse 5. The prophet continues, Your fathers, where are they? And the prophets, do they live forever? Two rhetorical questions which highlight the brevity of human life and also highlight the hazard of delaying repentance and getting yourself right with God. And uh, one of the things I'm fond of doing is that if you ask someone, how many years do you think you have left in your life? And somebody answers as well, I'm, say, 40 and three score and 10 is 70, so I've got about 30 years. That's an abstraction, Turn that around the other way. You've got about 1,500 weekends. Wow. I was with a Wall Street financier in New York, a Jewish fellow, and uh, 
we were talking about uh, somehow we got into the lifetime. I says, uh, yeah, Bernie, you've got uh, about 1,000 weekends left. He looked at me, kind of frowned. What do you mean? What do you mean? Well, you know, three score and 10, 20. You've got to figure, figure 70 is a nominal actuarial number. Um, that's about, and then about 1,000 weekends, do your own arithmetic. And he really got disturbed. Because that, see, 20 years is academic. That sounds like something on a mortgage note or something. See? But, you know, 1,000 weekends, ooh, you can almost make a paperclip chain and take one off each time a weekend goes by. You know? I don't know if you did that in college, how many days to the Army-Navy game or something. You know, you make a paperclip chain. I saw him years later, many lawsuits later, and um, he came up to me. He says, I remember that. 900 weekends, maybe, huh? You know, and we talked about it a little bit. Anyway, how many weekends do you have left? We don't know. Maybe one, two, maybe several dozen. But the point is, we're reminded of Psalm 90, verse 12. Lord, teach us to number our nanoseconds. That's the Intel translation. Lord, teach us to number our days that we might apply our hearts to wisdom. Now, we have to rely. What can you rely on these days to do something meaningful? Only one thing, really, and that's the Lord's Word. It's interesting, as we plan careers, as we go out to conquer things, one of the most terrifying things, I think, in life is to pick a race and win it and discover you entered the wrong race. It's frustrating to enter a race and maybe not finish where you'd like. But what's even more frustrating is to discover that you may have put all your energies in the wrong race. Well, I could, I could talk a lot about that one as, as someone who is a corporate venturer. But um, let's we'll just go on. That's verse 6. God continues. This is God speaking through Zechariah. But my words and my statutes, which I commanded my servants, the prophets, did they not take hold of your fathers? And they returned and said, Like as the Lord of hosts thought to do unto us according to our ways and according to our doings, so hath he dealt with us. The word but up there is a strong adversative. God's word is permanent, unchangeable, immutable. Now we need, as we talk about these things, also to make another distinguishing thing. I feel moved to make another comment. And that is, let's distinguish between the weakness and the fragility of God's servants. And that includes televangelists and pastors. One of the most disturbing things that sometimes shakes us to our (laughs) core is when Major names fall some way and stumble. It's amazing how we as a body insist that our, our pastors be sinless and perfect. We obviously aren't. And it's tragic when people of note stumble. And uh, we need to, to distinguish between our own fragility and the abiding veracity of God's word and the eternal effectiveness of the message that these prophets bring. And uh, did not my words overtake your fathers? See, he's, he's almost... The, the model that comes to our mind in our culture is a highway patrolman pulling you over for some infraction. And um, the Word of God is like pulling a speeder over. He will nail us with precision for any of our uh, infractions. And we need to understand that. By the way, the word overtake that's used to overtake here is a direct quote from Moses in Deuteronomy 28, but we'll go on. Now, there are many external symbols, especially in the Old Testament, of turning back to God, such as wearing sackcloth. We see that in Jonah, Nehemiah, Daniel, Joel, Isaiah. We see references to that. Also, sitting on ashes. We see that in Esther as well as Daniel, Isaiah, elsewhere, and, of course, Job. What's far more important than rending our clothes is rending our hearts. God is looking for broken hearts. Broken hearts. There's an expression in the Navy, a turn 1-8. You know what a turn 1-8 is? When you do relative turns, it's always in, in tens of degrees. So turn 1A is a turn 180. And most of us in our lives need to execute a turn 1A, 180 degree repentance. Now we're going to get into, this is the preamble, this is the setting the stage. Now we're going to get into the first of these eight visions. And uh, some uh, commentators like McGee and Luck and some of the others say there's really ten I won't quarrel at it. It depends on how you divide certain things. The more conventional view is to see these as a series of eight visions. But they're all in one night. This must have been a heavy evening. And uh, they bridge the centuries between the rebuilding of the temple and when the kingdom is restored to Israel. Now, do you remember in Acts chapter 1, about verse 6, where Jesus is ascending? Just before they ascend, the disciples are you now going to restore the kingdom to Israel? 
And Jesus says it's not for you to know the times and seasons. He doesn't say he's not going to do it. It just wasn't their concern at, the time, at that time. He is going to restore the kingdom of Israel. That's yet future. From the, the rebuilding of the temple, which is going on at this time, to the end, these prophecies, these visions, these eight visions are going to encompass that period of time. I believe that's why they were given all at one night. These are not a disconnected set of random subjects. They are connected. And that is the, the, the unifying theme among them. Each one of these visions will have the same pattern. There will be a description of things seen, a question of a nearby angel of what does it mean, and an explanation. Straightforward enough. Now let's start at verse 7. This is going to be what's called the vision of the horse rider and the myrtle trees. There's a red horse with a rider on it, and he's among some myrtle trees. And uh, verse 7. Upon the fourth and twentieth day of the eleventh month. Now let me stop right there. I have no idea why the Holy Spirit gave us that precision. But I am fascinated with it because so many things happen on the 24th day of some month in the Bible, if you watch for it. Why is it? I don't know. I do believe somewhere along the way, somebody, maybe it's one of you, will make a discovery as to why that date is so significant. I don't believe there's anything trivial in God's Word. It's here for a reason. Upon the fourth and twentieth day of the eleventh month, which is the month of Shabbat. Now, Shabbat is the Babylonian label for that month. Bear in mind, they just came out of captivity, so they picked up vocabulary from Babylon. Shabbat. In the second year of Darius came the word of the Lord unto Zechariah, the son of Berechiah, the son of Edo, the prophet, saying. Now, this would have been on our calendar, February 15th of 519 B.C., And Shabbat, of course, is the Babylonian 11th month adopted by the Jews after the exile. This date was about five months after the building of the temple was resumed, Haggai chapter 1 and 2. Three months after Zechariah's first prophecy. That's the one in a few verses back. And it's two months after Haggai's last prophecy. Now, interestingly enough, and uh, I think I'll leave this, once we've gone through the eight prophecies, I'll show you a pattern among the eight. But I believe they're in a chiastic pattern. And uh, that may be hard to, to describe to you verbally. I will uh, do a, a, a graphical presentation when it comes up later. This is the first of the eight. It'll mean more for you when you've seen all eight prophecies. Then we'll try to put them in perspective. Anyway, let's get to verse 8. I saw by night, and behold... Now, there's an exclamatory style to the structure here. I saw by night, and behold, a man riding upon a red horse. And he stood among the myrtle trees that were... In the bottom, and behind him there were red horses, speckled and white. Now, these other horses have riders, I believe, but they're implied, not express. And that's, it seems, to put our attention on the lead rider. One of the questions in our mind is who is the rider of the red horse? What does it mean? And why is he among myrtle trees? And what do you mean they were at the bottom? Now, incidentally, he says, I saw by night. He's awake. This is not a dream. This is a vision. There's a difference. He's awake. He's as applied by his questions. He's going to interrogate an angel about what's going on here. Now, the man riding the red horse, apparently, was the leader. And he's receiving reconnaissance reports from the rest. We'll see as these verses unravel here. And uh, he is seen standing, but what that implies, he's astride, like he's standing in the saddle. He's, he's, he's expected. He will be identified... In verse 11, it'll turn out, as the angel of the Lord. Now, if you've done your homework in the Old Testament, that phrase will ring to you familiar. There are angels all through the scripture, good ones and bad ones. But uh, the angel of the Lord is a very unique phrase. It first occurs in Genesis 16, verse 7. And uh, it is there clearly the angel of Yahweh, the angel of Jehovah. And in Exodus 23... God's name was in this one. He's identified with Yahweh in a number of places. I'll put all the references in the notes that accompany the tape, but the net of it is, this. most scholars recognize Angel of the Lord as a designation for a pre-incarnate appearance of Jesus Christ, the second person of the Trinity. It's a, what some people call a theophany, which is a fancy name for an appearance of the second person of the Trinity in the Old Testament, in the, in the role here, if you will, of a messenger, the angel of the Lord. Now, don't confuse him 
with the angel that talks with Zechariah. You'll discover if you watch very carefully the subsequent verses, there's really two angels. There's the angel of the Lord, that's the leader on this red horse. And the angel that talked with there's another angel sort of acting as an uh, interpreter or commentator to uh, Zechariah. And uh, we'll see that, um, that the angel is talking with him in, in uh, verse 8, chapter 2, verse 3, chapter 4, verse 1 and 5, and chapter 5, verse 5, and, and chapter 6, verse 4. You'll see him come along all the way. Now, why is he riding a red horse? Different views. Red seems to suggest war and judgment. We see that come up in Revelation 19. Now, there Jesus shows up riding a white horse, but he's dripping. He has a vesture dipped in blood. When you see the second coming of Jesus Christ described by Isaiah in chapter 63, first four verses, who is this that's coming from Edom? That looks like he's been stepping in the wine press. You know, he's drenched with the blood of his enemies. Strange, strange label. It's not familiar to us unless you read in your homework in the, in the Old Testament. So the red is suggestive of that. Now, the white uh, horse, uh, that we find we've got uh, a number of different horses here. We've got white, which typically is assumed to be uh, righteousness, mercy, or peace, something like that. But then there are some of these horses that are speckled, sorrel, tawny, translated brown. Some, that word is, we're not sure what it means. You, these are guesses, the speckled or tawny or sorrel. You find those in different translations. Because it's only used here in the Old Testament. What that word really meant in the days of Zechariah is a subject of scholastic uh, inquiry. But you notice that I believe the angel of the Lord is not on a white horse, so it doesn't get confused with Revelation chapter 6. That's a whole other thing. So, uh, see, if he was on a white horse, people in Revelation 6 would jump to the conclusion that must be the angel of the Lord. We're clearly in Revelation 6, it's the Antichrist posing. So that's why there's a, I, I suspect, part of the, the dynamics here. Now, the present participle here is used. It means the writers were in the act of riding at the time of the vision. It's a present participle. They're riders, I think. If they're only implied. Then it says there are any riders on these other horses, but we sort of assume they are. The portrayal seems to be that they're out gathering information for the leader, and he is receiving their reports in effect. Now, Christ is said to be among the myrtle trees. Now, the myrtle, or hadassah in the Hebrew, is a shrub that's very indigenous to Israel, it happens to be the same name as the Jewish version of the name of Esther. And uh, it's an indigenous shrub that grew uh, all over it. So it became a popular uh, label for Israel itself. And uh, also it was prominent in the Feast of Tabernacles. It was one of the uh, trees that were used to construct booths in the celebration of the Feast of Tabernacles. You find that in Nehemiah 8 and also in Leviticus 23 where those things are discussed. So it's suggestive of the millennium. And yet it's in the hollow, is what it really says, or a low point, uh, Matsula, in a deep place, a low ravine. This was the low time in their history. And where is Christ at that time? Among them is the portrayal. They're at a low point. He's among the myrtle trees, which is symbolic of Israel. And he's receiving these reports. And then verse 9, he says, Then said I, O my Lord, what are these? And the angel talked with me. In fact, it doesn't actually say talked with me. The Hebrew actually says, talked in me. Somehow he's communicating with him more directly than just audibly. Said unto him, I will show thee what these be. Now this interrogation element is, is present in each of the eight visions. And again, don't assume that the angel is talking with him is the angel of the Lord. Those are two different uh, things. So, Verse 10, And the man that stood among the myrtle trees answered and said, These are they whom the Lord hath sent to walk to and fro through all the earth. Their job was to reconnoiter and patrol the events, movements, and happenings on the earth. Now this is interesting to me. I don't know this to be true, but I wouldn't be a bit surprised. Uh, there is a parallel here with the seven eyes that we will see later in chapter 3 and 4, and in also in Revelation chapter 5, verse 6, where the seven eyes are a way of describing Jesus Christ. Also, uh, this going to and fro is a phrase, if you pick up the scripture, that's what Noah's raven did when he left the ark. And uh, that's uh, uh, what the Lord himself did in Second Chronicles 16. And that's also what Satan is indicated as doing in Job chapter 1 and 2. Looking to and fro to see who, who he could accuse. And so on. Verse 11. Then answered the angel of the Lord that stood among the myrtle trees. See there it tells you that it was the angel of the Lord being the writer. And said, We have walked to and fro through the earth. And behold, all the earth sitteth still and is at rest. Now, if you read that verse naively, that sounds great. Gee, there's peace on the earth. Isn't that wonderful? 
Not when you understand what they have been led to believe was God's plan. Because I thought God was going to judge all these nations that are abusing them. And everything's quiet. That verse is viewed by most uh, uh, the scholars as being a tone of disappointment on the part of Israel. And verse 12, Then the angel of the Lord answered and said, O Lord of hosts, how long will... Th-? Now this is the angel of the Lord addressing the first person of the Trinity. Okay? How long wilt thou not have mercy on Jerusalem and the cities of Judah, against which thou hast had indignation these three score and ten years? And see, the return of the exiles was not fulfilled yet. If you look at the prophecies that talk about the return to the land, there's a lot of things that hadn't happened yet. They're happening in our day, by the way. That's why this is so timely for all of us. Because he's pointing out that the return that's described, you'll find this return described in Jeremiah 25 and 29. I won't take the time in the interest of making progress here to go into it, but uh, that prophecy hasn't been fulfilled yet. There's much more to come. The prophecies in Jeremiah 25 and 29 are being fulfilled today and still incomplete. Nation Israel reformed on May 14th of 1948. The return of biblical Jerusalem, the old city, to Israel in June of 1967. And uh, now the U.S. is forcing Israel into the so-called peace process. And, and uh, all these things are uh, continuing as we speak. And one of the questions you need to ask yourself, I wonder how long we can poke our finger in the eye of God before his promise is finally realized. And part of that promise involves Ezekiel 38 and 39 and the impending invasion in Israel. Now, by the way, I'm going to suggest as we go, I'll just try to let you know where we're headed. These eight visions, I believe, will parallel what happens in Revelation chapter 5 on. And uh, we'll see, you can make that parallel yourself as we go. These visions are a prelude to the unleashing of calamities that will be the prerequisite to Israel's restoration in the millennial blessing. God is going to restore Israel, but there's much to be done in in advance. Verse 13, the Lord answered the angel that talked with me with good words and comfortable words. In other words, we're going to discover there are three declarations coming and four words of comfort. Verse 14, so the angel that communed with me said, Cry thou, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, I am jealous for Jerusalem and for Zion with a great jealousy. That's the first key declaration. This is the focal point of this prophecy, this first of the eight, that God is watching, he's keeping score, he's jealous and zealous for Jerusalem. And again, the, the, the word is kana, it's from an Arabic root, kana'a, which it means to become very red. So God is not watching this in a detached intellectual way, he's watching the apple of his eye. And we need to remember that as we read our papers. And we watch the chicanery that's going on in Israel as we do this study. Now, God has spoken of his je- jealous or zealous in many places, right in the middle of the Ten Commandments, Exodus 20, verse 5, Exodus 34, Deuteronomy 5, a lot of places. Let's move on. Verse 15, And I am very sore displeased with the heathen that are at ease, for I was but a little displeased, and they helped forward the affliction. Now, God is exceedingly angry with the nations. Is what, and the question, as you watch this, one of the questions we have in our mind, how about today? When we get to Zechariah 12, we will have much to say about what's going on today in in Israel. Verse 16, Thus saith the Lord, I am returned to Jerusalem with mercies. My house shall be built in it, saith the Lord of hosts, and a line shall be stretched forth upon Jerusalem. Now, God is going to judge these nations. That's the third uh, word that's in these three elements. Now we come to four comforting words. The Messiah will come to Jerusalem. See, the glory of the Lord had departed from Jerusalem, the Shekinah, if you will. If you may recall, if you study this in Ezekiel chapter 10 and 11, they actually, he records how the Shekinah left the Holy of Holies, hovered over the porch, went over to the eastern gate, hesitated, went up to the Mount of Olives, and then ascended. The glory of the Lord physically left the temple prior to its destruction. And Ezekiel describes that. And uh, what this, this is kind of remote to our, our thing, years in mind, but one of the aspirations or hope of Israel was that the Messiah was to return, the glory of the Lord would return, and that is here declared. And the second temple that they were building was just a partial fulfillment. There's a promise of a temple they'd never seen. That's in Ezekiel chapter 40 through 48, details that. That's yet future. 
And Zechariah will have much more to say about that when we get to chapter 2. Now Jerusalem's boundaries will expand. The ravaging of the Babylonians in 586 B.C., the Romans in 70 A.D. notwithstanding, a surveyor's line would be stretched out, is the expression used. But that implies an enlargement, if you will, of the city of Jerusalem. Verse 17. Cry yet, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, My cities through prosperity shall yet be spread abroad. And the Lord shall yet comfort Zion, and yet shall yet choose Jerusalem. Even though there's prosperity, there's going to be a diaspora. They're going to be spread abroad. And the Lord shall yet comfort Zion. That's, again, uh, yet future. Verse 4. God would once again choose Jerusalem is one of the key thoughts here. It's interesting, even the book of Romans, chapter 11, verse 25, it says the gifts and calling of God are irrevocable, or the way it's expressed, are without repentance, which is a strange way maybe to our ears. The gifts and calling of God are without repentance, are irrevocable. God chose Jerusalem. They're in big trouble now, and they're still in big trouble today. But the promise of God, and that's what God is expecting us to rely on, is that he will once again demonstrate his choice of Jerusalem. Now you and I say, gee, what's that got to do with us? Remember how the book of Romans presents us. We are presented as the wild branches grafted in to the uh, olive tree. So we're grafted in. So you and I, if we are grafted in, should derive some comfort from what comforts Israel. Now, I should point out something to you. Here is where chapter 2 ends in the Hebrew. The Hebrew divisions are a little different than our English. And this may be a a sign of relief because we'll break it here. We'll carry the rest of the chapter as part of our our next uh, exploration because I've dragged you through the uh, rather, perhaps rather tedious uh, background of history before we get into the real meat here. But uh, we have uh, encountered the introduction to the book, the first uh, few verses, and then this first of eight visions, the rider among the myrtle trees. And um, we'll obviously uh, continue attacking one by one each of the visions, which each will be illuminating its own right, but when you put them all together, give you a whole overview from the temple period of that time until the establishment of God's kingdom on the uh, planet Earth. Now, as you look at all of this, I presume that one of the things that draws us into the book of Zechariah is his remarkable insights that we're going to see surface in the text. Amazing, amazing predictions that are right on target. But the real value of the book, maybe not what draws us initially, but the real value of the book is to lay out in front of us not only the political issues that are facing the world today, but also the spiritual issues that affect every one of us that are part of his kingdom. So, let's stand for a closing word of prayer. Well, Father, we just praise you for who you are. We thank you, Father, that your word is true. And we thank you, Father, that you've seen fit to lay out in advance what you are about to do. We thank you, Father, for this opportunity to explore your word in the writings of Zechariah. We pray, Father, that you would indeed draw each of us into this text and reveal what you would have for us through the ministry of your Holy Spirit. We commit, Father, before you the time ahead to gather together to devour your word, that your words were found and we did eat them, the prophet says. Well, Father, we desire that same meal. And we pray, Father, that you would illuminate your text to us, that we might behold what you would have of us in response in the days ahead. As we commit ourselves before you, indeed, in the name of Yeshua, our Lord and Savior, in whose name we pray. Amen.